What's going on guys? Gunner here and this is episode two of Tie Like a Pro. Um, today we're going over articulating flies. Um, basically I just want to go over you know how or, you know why articulating flies kind of happened. Um, just really quick theory uh, and principles about that. We'll go over you know uh, hooks, uh, hook spacing, um, getting the right, you know, getting a perfectly vertical loop so that you can get a side-to-side -side movement um, and just some real basic stuff to get you guys started. Um, so if you think about streamers in general and um, uh, basically materials are only so long, right? So if you wanted, back in the day, if you wanted to tie a really long fly, um, you basically needed a really long hook shank to be able to stack it on. And, and so when you know uh, kind of the pioneers of the sport were getting into big streamers you know you're talking about tying on 7x long hooks or something with what you know they got like a three inch long shank um, that way you have space to stack all these materials which are limited in length right um, and so what happened is <clears throat> and this isn't uh, an always true principle and it, it depends on your watershed and your forage and all this but most predators are geared towards eating fishes heads They'll either attack the head to stun the fish, or they'll eat the head or eat the fish head first. Most fish, most prey species, forage species, are designed not to get eaten backwards. They either have spines on their dorsals, spines on their pec fins. They got enlarged gills that they can flare to basically choke a predator who's trying to eat them backwards so that they can escape. So. What what happened is you'd have these really long shank flies. Fish would come up and eat the head, and your you know your bends way out here, and you're not hooking fish. So what they did is they articulated it. You by articulating it, you break that shank into two separate portions. You get a hook up front. So that's kind of why articulating flies happened. It's so that you could get a long fly, an extended body, right? Popovic solved this problem by extending a heavy monofilament. He'd tie on the monofilament. Chocolate solved this problem by doing fish spines, right? It's an extended body. You put uh, basically tailing materials on shanks or some type of a structure articulated behind a fly to build your silhouette, but you have a short shank up front, like a lot of saltwater patterns, EP flies, things for tarpon. They all have short shanks up front. Predators attack the head, which is usually designated by a gill or an eye or counter shading or some type of contrast or a hot spot. So that's why articulating flies happened. So if you want to articulate and fly, there's basically a very simple principle in this. Um, well, yeah, basically, you take your back hook, whatever it is, and your front hook is usually, this is just 90% of the time, there's obviously ways to break the rule, uh, it's usually one size bigger, especially if you stay in the same hook model. So the models are going to have the same, uh, basically, characteristics, shank length, gap, wire thickness. So for most streamers, if your back hook's a four, your front hook's a two. If your back hook's a one, your front hook's a one knot. It's just a very, you know, it's a rule of thumb to get you started uh, tying your own flies. Um, that rule is easily broken. You can go from a four to a one. You can go from a one to a two watt, um, things of that nature. If you change hook models, um, and you can't see it down here, but I have a size two in the vise. Uh, it's a size two uh, trout predator from Arex, and this is a size two uh, deep water saltwater streamer from Arex. And it's a thicker wire, slightly longer shank. So it's the same size, two and two, but this is a thicker wire, slightly wider gap, longer shank. Even though they're the same size, I changed the style, um, so you can you can articulate that way. So I'm gonna get the camera on the vise here. We're gonna go over basically proper spacing. Now that we kind of have hooks on par, um, I will say this. Um, there's a lot of slack for whatever reason in the fly fishing community about using big hooks, big, big, big hooks for trout um, and causing damage to a trout's mouth. And I'll just say, uh, basically, if you pinch your barb, if no matter how big of a hook you use and you stick a fish, it's just going to create a hole. And as long as your barb's pinched, it's going to come right back out that hole. You did basically zero damage. I've seen personally from fishing more damage caused from a size 16 that has a barb on it because you can't get it out and you're down there with your pliers and you're holding this fish and you're reefing on it. Um, if you're gonna practice catch and release, pinch of barbs. Uh, I use big hooks as a design principle, wire mass, hook bends, uh, keeling action, um, all of that's kind of important to my designs. I fish two watts for trout 
all the time. Um, and if you pinch your barbs, you're not going to do much damage. Um, so just keep that in mind. Don't be afraid of big hooks. Uh, they're extremely important a lot of times for jerk flies, uh, momentum and tail kick on articulating flies and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, let's get back to tying. Sorry for that, I digress. But, okay, so to begin, uh, something that I think is extremely important is that you understand that the length of your tail sets the entire proportions for the fly. And we're gonna go over silhouettes in a different video, but you need to understand that the length of your tail sets the silhouette for the fly. Here's a picture of, of uh, the variant, which was the predecessor uh, to the hot fuzz. You can see I have a tail length. Now my wing length comes halfway down my tail. My front wing comes halfway down my back wing. My head comes halfway up my front wing. It's a, per, it's, a, it's a relative rule of halves. So whatever you set your tail length to, that's gonna control your wing length, gonna control your wing length, gonna control your head length. It's a very standard rule of thumb that's gonna control your ability to create a teardrop silhouette. This is gonna build bulk forward. It's gonna help your fly swim because the head's gonna be bulkier and push water over a slick tail. Very basic. So when you come in to articulate a fly, the most important thing that you're gonna do is control the tail length, and you control the tail length by measuring it off your hook. So whatever hook you have, I don't care what it is, whether it's an eight or a two watt, it does not matter, because as long as you measure off a hook, you can grow a fly proportionally. Now, when you get to a certain size, you're gonna to have to incorporate material swaps to get longer wings or a bulkier height, et cetera, et cetera, so that you create that teardrop, you maintain that silhouette. But for the most part, everything you do is gonna be based off your hook shank length. So selecting a hook shank that you find aesthetically pleasing is important. Every designer has a certain preference. I don't think you can really read into that more than it's a personal preference. Kelly loves to tie on, and I shouldn't speak for him, sorry Kelly, but he ties on 3X long Daiichi 2461s. It's a 3X long, thin wire hook, small gap, relatively small gap. That's what he designs on. That's what sex dungeons are built on. When he measures his tail, it's on a 3X long hook. When he measures his wing, it's on a 3X long hook. I like to tie on 2X long hooks, wide gaps, thick wire. I fish for bass, I fish for pike, I fish for trophy, big predator, meat-eating suckers that want a meal. And these hooks, I just, I find them aesthetically pleasing. It's intuitive for me to build a silhouette off this fly. So be aware of that. Uh, the hook model that an individual designs a fly around is important for that design. I know people, they don't like to buy everything that's in a video, but hooks are important. So, this is a 2X long hook. I have, a, I pinched my material, run it up to my eye. That's the shank length. I want about a shank and a half. So I'm just gonna basically do a shank and a half. Basically, yep, come in with my, uh, I need to spin that a little bit. Come in with a pinch wrap, set, lock. I might wrap that back a little bit to my bend. Booyah, and then I'm gonna run this up the body. So that right there, that tail, controlled the entire length of my fly and it's going to have an impact on the the material that I select for my wing or the length oh that's how you dull scissors right there or the material that I choose for my wing uh, so that it lands basically halfway and I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, palmer chenille off the body chenille is gonna fall about halfway and then I'm gonna uh, collar this with schloppen which is gonna fall about back to the bend so the whole back is gonna be a teardrop so that's relatively important. I'm not gonna finish this fly. I just wanted to talk about tail length because the tail length sets your proportions for the entire fly. But I'm gonna come up. Oh, I have something that I wanna say. Um, so we talked about how hooks are typically, and this is on average, but I have a piece of paper somewhere. <laughs> oh, there it is. So before I articulate this real quick, I talked about how your back hook and your front hook are typically different by one size. Your back being a size two, your front being a size one, et cetera, et cetera. The reason why that is, and this is my opinion on it, and it's because, um, yeah, you guys can see that pretty well. So check this out. You want your body 
to be basically the same. You're tying a woolly bugger in the back, you tie a woolly bugger in the front. The difference is, is you might wrap this with a longer piece of slopping. You might wrap this with the denser wraps of polar chenille, or you might use a more viscous chenille like a polar reflector flash, which is denser. So you build the identical body, but you build it basically one size up. So this is the same shank length. You're building, you're rinsing and repeating. You're making a carbon copy on the front, but using denser wraps, and then you have X amount of room, which is your size difference, for the head. This naturally builds bulk forward. It creates a proportional fly um, that basically you can grow by uh, basing your entire pattern off your tail length, which is dictated by your shank length. That's why that is. So, that's kind of cool. Now we're gonna come in, I'm gonna start my thread on here. Get a nice viscous surface if you have a lot of length. Um, I find about four layers of thread to be pretty good. The wire that I use for articulating a fly, I get it from a craft store. It is nylon coated stainless steel wire. I like to use a high strand ratio. This is gonna make it flexible and reduce its kinking. If you use a seven strand, it's gonna have a higher kink tendency. I think the other option is about 18 strands. That's probably average for most people. This is the last size, which is 49. The diameter of the wire is your braking strength. This is 0.024 inch diameter. Um, it's basically 40 pound uh, bite wire. It's identical to a real bite wire. It's identical to American fishing wire. Um, your store might not have a beetle on, they might have a different brand, but you're looking for the strand ratio, you're looking for the diameter, 0.024. That's what I use. Um, you look at Kelly Gallup, he likes to use 0.018. It's about 30 pound. If you go below 0.018, your flies will break. Your tail hook will fall off after about six to 10 fish, depending on how big they are. The wire just gives, uh, it gets kinked, it, it gets dragged around a lot, it's not as stiff. Um, so it's something to be aware of and pay attention to. I like the thickest wire. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I got to say about that. My personal preference is to pin my wire to the side of my hook. Now if you look at the side of your hook and you split that into eighths, so you're doing eighth above a quarter and an eighth below a quarter. Does that make sense? You're gonna create a flat surface uh, with respect to the top of your hook. I'm gonna come in, catch that with a nice uh, pinch wrap, run that down the entire eighth below my quarter, which is nine, if you, if you split your hook into quarters, right? Quarters, I'm talking about a lower eighth and an upper eighth. Does that make sense? You split a hook into quarters, low eighth, upper eighth. That's where I'm running this and I'll run it to the start of the bend. And so I'm gonna flip my vise over so you can see this, um, and it's gonna obviously invert it to the top. You guys see that? See what I'm saying? Now for most applications, I like to use a single bead. This is a hairline dubbing 3D bead. It's about six millimeters in diameter. If you have smaller beads, two, two millimeters, three millimeters, use two of them. You see what I'm saying? Um, and it's kind of what I just found to be a, a really nice spacing to get a hook that won't fall. And we're gonna talk about that real quick. I tie one wire in at a time, by the way. I think you get more grip on each wire. I have more confidence that that strand is more secure. When you tie them in together, there's a more free space between those wires and you have less uh, force per wire. I have 100% force on this wire and I'll have 100% force on that wire. You tie them in together, you have 100% force on two wires, so you're kind of splitting the difference there. So I'm gonna thread this. It's important that your wire does not twist when it goes through the loop. So whatever, when your wire's on the bottom, you want it to stay on the bottom, you come up, the wire that goes on the top stays on the top. I'm gonna to create a loose loop, and I'm gonna put one turn of thread there. Now right now, my loop is more or less perfectly vertical. It's because my wire didn't have any twist in it. If your wire was flat, you guys see that? I just flattened it. You can, I'm spinning my wire between my forefinger and my thumb. You spin your wire to control your loop. I'm gonna spin that. I have one turn of thread, add a little tension. I have a perfectly vertical loop. I'm gonna wrap back to my bend. Now this spacing is ideal. The spacing is, and I'll zoom in here. I like my loop 
to be about the distance of my bead. So this is a six millimeter bead. This is about a six millimeter loop, relatively speaking. You see what I'm saying? That's a nice amount of free space. I'm gonna come wrap this up. Normally I'd put, uh, actually I'll just do it because this video is about articulating flies. Normally, I'd come all the way up, I'd come all the way back, come all the way up. So I'm putting basically one, two, three, three full turns of thread. I guess I'm doing another one. Didn't see that coming. Um, <laughs> so that's how I'd handle that. And that's not going anywhere. I always hit mine with super glue. You don't have to. Um, but I just want you to look at this spacing. I'm going to take this out of the vise. I want you to look at that spacing. And something to pay attention to is if I relax this, this is basically 12, I guess, yeah, 12 millimeters, a full centimeter or so back from my hook bend. That's kind of important. I'm going to talk about why. This is an Aberdeen bend. This is an Aberdeen bend. I'm going to come in with a stinger hook real quick. This is an A-Rex stinger hook, size 1.0. This is an A-Rex Trout Predator Aberdeen. You can see uh, the, the hook eyes are aligned basically. You can see how much farther back that bend goes, right? That bend goes back a full almost six millimeters. If you articulate a fly on a six millimeter or a, on a stinger hook, it's going to have a greater tendency to fall if you only use a single bead spacing. I'm gonna cut and paste here and jump forward real quick. So I just articulated this uh, really quickly for you guys. And I'm sorry that this hook has material on it, but you can see if I let that hang, how much closer that is to the back of my bend, that's gonna have a greater tendency to come up here and wrap and follow. And it's because the stinger bends are extended. Typically, if you use a stinger hook on the front hook, I will typically articulate with two beads, extend that backwards, lower tendency to follow. Um, so yeah, basically that's how that goes. When you pin it on the side, you have a little bit more forgiveness in tying this back farther. I could probably tie that back to about there um, and then have less tendency to follow. As soon as you tie it on top of the hook, uh, if you tie it back super far, you'll have to chase your bend down and your loop won't be vertical anymore. It'll be angled down. That's why I like to pin stuff on the side. So hopefully all that makes sense. Um, and I just want to articulate real quick, one of the reasons why I like that thicker wire is because it creates a nice stiff loop. This is a nice stiff loop. You can see this fly has all the movement in the world to articulate within that loop. Um, and that loop is nice and stiff. It's not gonna bend up here while you're casting to fall, uh, but that hook eye has a lot of movement within that. It's almost like articulating with a shank. So, uh, a lot of you guys might have um, single hook waters. You might have single hook requirements. Um, and again, we talked about the uh, the reason, the initial reason, I'm back this way up, the initial reason for articulating a streamer was to get a hook up front, um, kind of with an extended body. You can extend a shank. If I had the option, I'd put the shank behind the hook. I wouldn't put the shank in front of the hook. There's an exception to that is if you use a really short shank and you have a long tailing material. This is a 20 millimeter shank. Uh, you could basically stack your head on that shank, get an articulated movement, and with a longer tail section, this is still in the proper placement for head eats and stuns. So just things to consider, things to think about. Um, Hopefully that answers most of your questions about articulating, why you articulate, how you articulate, um, basically selecting your hooks and matching your tail proportion to your rear hook to build a basically teardrop fly. Um, and here's a just a really good example of bulk forward, light wispy tail, everything's based off the proportions of that tail uh, measured off the shank of that rear hook. Um, and these are different hook models, but they're both number twos. This one being a wider gap, thicker wire hook, longer shank. Um, so yeah, check that out. Hopefully that brings you up to speed on articulating flies. Um, a lot of this is going to come into play in the next few tutorials. So thanks for watching. Thanks for sticking through that. I know that was a little bit long and a little bit long winded. Um, and hopefully I'll see you guys in episode three of Tie Like a Pro. And thanks for following. Have a good one.